we're very excited today to have uh, as our guest Frank Giannis, who is the Deputy Commissioner for Food Policy and Response of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. He is the principal advisor to the FDA Commissioner on Food Safety Policies, including the implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act. His leadership role covers a broad spectrum, such as outbreak response, traceback investigations, product recall activities, and supply chain innovation. Mr. Giannis came to the FDA from leadership roles at with both Walmart and the Walt Disney Company. He has been long recognized for his role in elevating food safety standards and building food safety management systems based on science and risk. And we at AFTO have been thankful for his leadership and partnership in making progress in the fight for food safety. In addition to working uh, for the well-known global brands we just discussed, Giannis is the author of Food Safety Culture, Creating a Behavior-Based Food Safety Management System, past president of the International Association for Food Protection, and a recipient of the 2007 NSF Lifetime Achievement Award for Food Safety Leadership. Uh, please join me in welcoming Deputy Commissioner Giannis and his presentation on the FDA's blueprint for smarter food safety. Welcome, Frank. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that warm introduction, the invitation, uh, and the kind comments, and uh, you know, just a big thank you to all of the attendees that are viewing today. I know how busy you are. I was mentioning to Steve before the webinar that I should get a frequent flyer T-shirt for how often I join these after events, but I share that with you with a bit of humor, but uh, with a lot of sincerity. One of the reasons I love participating in after events is because I recognize uh, very sincerely the important role each and every one of you play in the overall safety net for this country and for this nation. Uh, as you heard from Steve before I joined the agency, I worked for two private firms and uh, many times in my career, in fact most of the times in my career, I was working with local regulators more than I was federal regulators, so I know what an important role you play. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. I've been asked to talk about the new era of smarter food safety. I suspect some of you have heard and read about it already. Uh, you might have even listened to some talks I've given on it. Uh, I was challenged today to try to go a little bit deeper into our plans and what we're thinking uh, so that we can all prepare and more than prepare, maybe create this future of a new era of smarter food safety together. And so I'm going to try to do just that. Uh, we'll go a little bit deeper into what we call the four core elements. Uh, we'll give you some early peeks at things that we're thinking about. It's an action plan. It's a blueprint, not an action plan. So we'll we'll talk at a high level. And I'm also going to try to touch base on some of the outbreaks we've been investigating this summer. Next slide, please. But before I go into it, I like to start off most of my uh, talks to audience these days with this uh, comment. Uh, there's no question about it. We as a society are just uh, going through one of the most historic events in our nation's history, uh, the, the global pandemic. And uh, I, I think you know that when it comes to food, but we've been very clear and adamant that the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, is not transmitted by food. It's a respiratory virus and not a virus uh, that causes uh, foodborne illness in the classical sense. We believe that the public has heard this message, but I think it's a message that all of us in the public health community have to continue to uh, deliver throughout the next uh, few months. The, the other thing I'd like to emphasize is that uh, I'm just in awe. If you think about it, the food system is pretty big. I've often stated that today's food system, especially the U.S. food system, is really impressive in my view, having worked in most continents around the world. It's, it's, the, it's the most uh, interesting and maybe the strongest food system in the world. Uh, and if you think about it, we've just experienced what I describe as the biggest test on our nation's food system in probably 100 years. While the virus wasn't transmitted through food, we know early in the pandemic we have consumers to stay at home, shelter in place, and so there was a rush of demand and consumers purchased a lot of products and stocked up. That initially caused some temporary out-of-stocks at your favorite grocery store, as you know. And then shortly after that, you know, the second domino fell and we found out that we had some logistical or supply chain issues as food was no longer going to, or could be sold at food service hotels or theme parks. What we found out early on in the pandemic is we had too much food in the wrong places. Not a lack of food supply, but supply chain logistics issues. Uh, lots of work has gone into effect over the past few months. Many of you were involved with these efforts. And I would say, looking at what's transpired over the past half year, that it's been a big test. 
have we aced the test, meaning scored 100% or gotten an A plus? No. But I think we passed the test. Uh, if you think about it, throughout the pandemic, consumers have been able to go into their grocery stores and find most of the SKUs available to them. There have been outages, certainly, but clearly the food system has worked to replenish and restock. And um, we've learned a lot. Certainly there were opportunities, and uh, you'll hear me talk about the need to create a more nimble, resilient, and interoperable food system. But by and large, we passed the test, and I would say it was because of these things. We, we know that worker safety, keeping employees in food and ag as a sector and in food production safe, is one side of the same coin as food continuity, food supply chain continuity. And so thank you for what you've done. Uh, I don't think, uh, having worked in the private sector and now in the public, that we would have gotten through this crisis to the place that we are today without the great work of men and women like each and every one of you. And so I just want to salute you very sincerely on behalf of all of the FDA and on behalf of the American people. What you've done is commendable. Uh, oftentimes we hear about heroes in the context of healthcare professionals in a pandemic, and they are heroes, and I continue to be in awe to this day as I hear stories about them. Uh, but we know that there's more than one front line in this pandemic, and you two are heroes. And so, again, just a big shout out for what you've done. Next slide, please. Now, one of the last times I presented to an AFTO audience, I asked this question, and I think it's worth asking again as we engage in today's discussion. By the way, I hope that today we have a conversation or discussion. It's not my intention, you'll see, to present at you or to talk at you. It really is to the best that we can through this virtual format is to engage in a conversation. And this question is always a good question. Are we winning the battle against foodborne disease? I've stated I love this question. I've asked it of audiences all over the world. My preference is to ask it in person because I love to hear how people respond. And I would say at least eight times out of ten, when people respond, the first responses that I get is, no, we are not winning the battle against people with disease. Think about your answer. I suspect that many of you thought no. Some people answer it a little bit more conditional and say, well, it's hard because the measurement is changing. We're getting so much better at detecting foodborne illnesses. It's hard to say whether we're winning or losing. Here's what I believe. We've won many battles against foodborne disease throughout history. If you look at the 20th century and infectious disease rates that plummeted largely through improvements in sanitation, advancements in medicine, but certainly progress made in battling foodborne pathogens such as pasteurizing milk, uh, has that certainly played a role. Uh, but in more recent times, and recent defined pretty broadly over the past couple of decades, I, I would say, I would answer, no, we're not winning the battle against newborn disease as measured. And what I like to turn to is probably the best report card or grade we have on our progress against newborn disease, and it's CDC and FoodNet data. You can go to the next slide, please. And while I'm not going to present the data quantitatively, you know that year after year we see these types of headlines. This was a headline just last year. This year all of the headlines have been related to COVID and certainly it's been a political year. Uh, but we know that when CDC and health departments report our progress against foodborne disease in the U.S., we see these types of statements. Little progress made or the progress against foodborne disease has stalled. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a public meeting presenting along with Rob Tuss from CDC. It was a USDA public meeting on salmonellosis and the state of the science. And the CDC presented data of the incidence of salmonellosis per 100,000 population over two decades. And it looked fairly flat. And in fact, if you looked at the last couple of years, there might be just a slight uptick in the number of cases of salmonellosis per 100,000 population. Um, if you think about one of the parasites mentioned here on this slide, cyclospora, last year we heard CDC report a 399% increase in cyclosporiasis. And so I think if you had to answer the question, uh, we're not making the types of progress that we would like to make. Certainly folks like you and I that are advocates for public health and passionate, we've spent our life's work trying to reduce the burden of foodborne disease, we'd like to see more progress. Now, the reality is there's probably several reasons why this is the case, and I have no doubt that our ability to 
improve, uh, improved ability to detect foodborne illnesses is part of the story. There's no question about it. We all know that we increasingly have the ability to find the needles in the haystack and to turn the invisible visible with tools such as whole genome sequencing, make connections in cases, isolated cases that we would have historically years past that when I was growing up in the profession claimed as sporadic cases, we find out, no, they're not sporadic at all. They're genetic matches. When we ask the right questions, oftentimes we find that there's a common food vehicle and we detect uh, and solve outbreaks that would have gone undetected literally a decade ago. And so um, the point is, I, I, I like this analogy and I'll use it again. We're in this race. And the race is between our ability to detect foodborne illnesses and our ability to prevent foodborne illnesses. And to win the race, we have to accelerate prevention. Just like public health departments and the CDC have improved our ability to detect foodborne illnesses using new approaches, smarter techniques, new and emerging technologies such as whole genome sequencing and putting patterns on the information highway and sending it to the CDC to see if there are clusters or signals. We also have to lean in with new and smarter approaches, new and emerging technology to accelerate prevention. And that's really the story today about a new era of smarter food safety is how do we accelerate prevention with more modern approaches. And we call that bending the curve of foodborne illness. In fact, we had been using this term for a while before the pandemic hit. Now that the pandemic hit, everybody's become familiar with flattening the curve and so people understand what we were talking about back then, and we will continue to talk about now and into the future. We have to bend the curve of foodborne illness. And we will do that, I have no doubt, together. And we will see that progress, I think, within the next few years. Next slide, please. So not only are we in this race, but the reality is the food system is changing. And, um, you know, some people think I, I, I'm being a little bit uh, sensational when I say we're in the midst of a food revolution. I, I don't think it's sensational at all. I look at my 30 plus years in the profession and what I've seen over the past few years is the level of investment being made in food and ag unprecedented, unlike anything we've ever seen before. We see new foods being developed. Talk about cell culture products. You talk about gene edited foods, you talk about new production methods scaling in a real and viable way. And we see the food system increasingly, one of the last business sectors, but the food system increasingly becoming digitized, which is a game changer. And so a lot has changed. Some people have stated that they expect to see more changes in food over the next 10 years that they've seen in the past 20 or 30. And just think about what we've just lived through and the changes that we've seen in the food system in the past six months alone and the new norms that are happening. And so I believe, and so do my colleagues here at FDA, based on the factors I've mentioned and the why is really important, that to succeed in these modern times, we're going to need more modern approaches. And so that's really at the heart of why this new era of smarter food safety is needed. The world around us is changing very rapidly and we have to constantly figure out how do we change along with the world to be more effective. Next slide, please. So this new era of smarter food safety uh, was an idea that was conceived uh, well over a year ago. I think many of you know we had a public meeting, uh, well attended, over 1,300 participated either virtually in person. We had all segments and stakeholders involved. Uh, we had a public docket. We had begun working on this new era concept last year, and we were on the verge of releasing our blueprint in March when the pandemic hit, and rightfully so, we had to put it on pause. But gratefully, behind the scenes, FDAers continue to work on it, and in July of this year, our commissioner, Dr. Stephen Hahn, unveiled the blueprint. And uh, some of you have heard of it. It's out there on our website. I hope that by now you've taken a, a, a close look at it and reviewed it. But it has four core elements that we think are the foundation for the future. Let me just share that. ACTA was with FDA at every step of the way as we passed FISMA and rolled out FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act. You've heard it was the most sweeping reform to our nation's food laws in over 100 years. ACTA members, I know that you were with FDA 
all along the journey, and you continue to be so. But just like then, uh, we're going to need you to be involved on this journey, and that's the reason why we're having this discussion today. The reality is a lot has changed since this passed in 2011, believe it or not, almost a decade ago. I've stated some of the things that have changed. And so the new era is part of this constant commitment, part of our values and belief system that the agency will always be looking at continued modernization and how we do our work to protect the American consumer. Uh, so that's really at the heart of it. I also like to emphasize that uh, smarter food safety has to be people-led. Uh, it will be FISMA-based and increasingly technology-enabled. The, the people-led is really important to me because if you think about the future, the future, as I mentioned earlier, isn't something we should simply try to predict. It should be something that we should create together in a way that's safer for people, good for business, and good for the planet. Um, it will continue to be FISMA based. We now have these wonderful set of rules, the FISMA rules and, and the main principle rules, the foundational rules as we described. And uh, I think they provide a wonderful framework. The question is how do we apply that FISMA framework now to the changing world around us? It's not that we have to constantly, constantly ask for major foundational rules. I think the ones that we have now are really good. And then lastly, food safety has to be increasingly technology enabled. And you'll hear me say this a couple of times, and I say this whenever I get a chance. I say this to congressional lawmakers. I say this to our office and budget. It's never about the technology, but it's always about the public health problem that we're trying to solve. If technology helps us solve it better, then we'll lean in on the technology. But don't think we're chasing technology for technology's sake. So the fourth foundational uh, pillars, if you will, uh, we call them core elements in the blueprint, are these four things. Uh, Tech-enabled traceability, smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response, um, new business models and traditional retail food safety, and food safety culture. I'm going to go into them in a little bit more detail and have a conversation. Then we're going to pause and certainly allow you to ask questions. And I'm going to take them in a different order than I normally do. Next slide, please. I'm going to start off with the ones that I've heard uh, APTO member, members are most interested in. And so let me begin with this idea or theme of food safety culture. My sense is uh, APTO members get this. Sometimes I've talked about food safety culture to audiences, especially in years past. A lot has changed in the past five years, but in years past, and people would roll their eyes and they'd say, you know, Frank, why do you want to talk about this culture thing? You've heard me say that I've been challenged to say culture is the soft stuff. We're food scientists. Let's talk about the food sciences, the hard stuff. And my favorite response to that, it's because working at a company with 2.2 million employees, I learned the hard way that it was the soft stuff that was the hard stuff. Folks that work at the state and local level, I know you know it's the soft stuff that's the hard stuff. How do you get people in the establishments that you regulate to follow the food code? or to follow safe food safety practices. Having the rules or policies in place, while important, is fairly easy. It's not what we write that's most important. It's not even what we know when we provide food safety education and training, which is really critical, and I'm glad we do that. But it's what we do that matters most. And so how do we do that? And so as part of our blueprint, we have a commitment to take a new look at this concept of food safety culture and principles and concepts of organizational culture and human behavior and behavior change to advance food safety. Next slide, please. Let me just briefly, why, why is this so important? I like to illustrate for food safety professionals that struggle with this. If you think about catastrophic events that have happened across society, you know, the big things that safety professionals in general and lawmakers and society at large gets really worked up over, when we put together the smartest men and women on teams to investigate and report back sometimes uh, to organizations, often to the government, on how, how in the heck did this crisis happen, what did they conclude? And almost every time, I would even go as far as saying every time, uh, you see these types of headlines. Uh, whether it was the BP oil spill, it wasn't just about the quality of the concrete or sand used to, be, to build that oil rig, it was what was referred to in the investigation report, a culture of complacency. 
How about a large automobile maker and uh, installing an automobile ignition switches that failed and caused you know, these tragic crashes and loss of life? Uh, it wasn't just a report that talked about the fault in the electrical engineering of those ignition switches, but it was reports that talked about a culture of silos in an organization where bad news didn't travel and it didn't travel fast to where it needed to get to. And one of my favorites uh, to illustrate this important point, although it's tragic, obviously, are the shuttle disasters, uh, two of them in particular. In this report, when the shuttle um, blew up because some of the foam insulation material came off of the le leading edge of the left wing, and um, the foam material actually came off of the rocket fuel booster tank and hit the leading edge of the left wing. And upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, you know what happened because of the damage on that wing, the shuttle disintegrated. But in that report, I remember, because I read it, it was two big books. I read them all word for word, back to back. There was one sentence that really jumped out at me. It said, in our view, the NASA organizational culture had as much to do with this accident as the foam. That's powerful. It wasn't just about the engineering of the foam material, but a culture that allowed that to happen. Next slide, please. So I would suggest, while you rarely or almost never, I've seen it once in the UK and once in New Zealand, while you rarely see a food outbreak or food scare attributed to culture, I would say that a lot of foodborne outbreaks, certainly the ones I suspect that you have investigated at the state and local level, have been more culture than they are about the hard sciences. For example, PCA. Uh, I joke that I was so frustrated shortly after that outbreak when I had a trade association send emails to all food professionals that say, salmonella's ability to survive in a low moisture food, what you need to know. Well, I'm a bench level microbiologist. That's how I started my career. I've known for years, long before PCA, that salmonella could survive in low moisture foods. And I would say that the PCA outbreak had more to do with that organization or company's culture than it did salmonella's ability to survive. I think you would too. How about melamine in the dairy, dried dairy products from China? Do you think that's about the chemistry? Sure, there's chemistry, melamine introduced into a product so that the product appears to be higher in protein content. But is it chemistry or is it a culture? Values and beliefs of people that would do that, uh, not caring about the safety of others. And also, how about ice cream? It's not to pick on any firms because you know, there's a lot of firms that have had these tragic consequences and they've gone on to try to do better. But this ice cream manufacturer was reported to be in, in existence during business for 108 years. Think about that, 108 years and they never had a food safety problem. And then lo and behold, almost overnight, they start getting reports that their product is linked to cases of listeriosis and they find out that they've been involved in an outbreak of listeria. Think, think about this, uh, a company that's been in existence in 108 years without a problem. Do you think that might lead to a culture of complacency? Boy, we've been doing this a long time. We've never had a problem. But what's happened? The world around us has changed. We now have the ability to find these needles in the haystack, uh, find microorganisms, do genetic fingerprinting or whole sequencing on them, and lo and behold, they're connected to an outbreak when they thought they probably never would have a problem like that. And so I would say that food safety culture is at the heart of a lot of the outbreaks and illnesses that we see. Next slide, please. So in the blueprint, if you've read the section on food safety culture, we're talking about we need to advance this concept of food safety culture, not as a tagline. Uh, it frustrates me when people say, well, you know, we've got a communication plan. Yeah, communication is part of creating culture. But we have to advance this as a credible subset of the profession, just like they've done in other studies. If you think about occupational safety and health, some of you might work in that field. You know that they've been working on culture and behavior-based safety for a long time now, realizing they could design and build the safest structures and give workers personal protective equipment, but there were still injuries, and so you had to figure out human behavior. Think about hospitals. In a culture of safety in hospitals, you can have trained doctors and nurses and still have accidents or, 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 or significant events, and how do you create a culture of safety in the hospital or medical environment? And so we have to do the same thing in our profession. Part of that is to continue to invest 
and advance the research of what we know about these concepts of organizational culture and food safety behavior. The good news is that the literature has really grown over the past few years. We also have to lean into behavioral science principles. And you know, we don't like to think of behavioral science as a science, but it is a science, just like food science. And over the past hundred years, there's been an explosion in the behavioral science and publications. And in fact, I love to consume behavioral science papers, uh, love to do that. Um, so we need to do that and leverage those insights. I'll give you some examples of behavioral science principles that I've leveraged in the past to what I think strengthen food safety. Uh, let's talk about the principle of commitment. There's a behavioral science principle uh, that's pretty simple that says if you publicly commit uh, verbally or even in writing to something, you're more likely to follow through because people don't want to be known as flip-floppers or wishy-washy, right? And so how might you leverage the principle of commitment in food safety? I know in my past career, one of the ways I leveraged the principle of commitment was in training and education that we provided. You know, oftentimes uh, when you bring employees in and you do training or education on food safety principles, you have them sign a roster or log. The primary companies do that. The reason they do that is they want to hold people accountable. You know, you've been through the food safety training, and if you don't follow the procedures, we'll write you up, we'll reprimand you. Wrong reason. The behavioral sciences tell us maybe you have them commit to practicing the principles that they've learned in that course. And study after study shows that if you commit to something in writing or verbally, you're more likely to follow through on those actions. Uh, let me give you another behavioral science principle just to illustrate the types of things that we're thinking about. How about the principle of social norm. We know that people are more likely, let's face it, we're overwhelmed these days. You probably have way too much information coming at you, I do too. And humans have been conditioned or evolved to take what I describe as mental shortcuts. I, I give you the principle of social norm really in an easy to understand fashion. When you're buying something online, do you look at reviews and ratings? Uh, do you say, hey, I only want to see things that have been rated five star or above or four stars or above or four thumbs or above? Yeah, you do, because the mental shortcut is if everybody else thinks this is good, they must know something that I don't, and it must be good, and so let me just look at those first. Um, that's the principle of short social norm, taking these mental shortcuts because everybody else can't be wrong. And so think about how you might leverage that in food safety. Um, one of the ways I like to do this is uh, – out of compliance rates or in compliance rates? Perfect example, hand washing. Uh, it used to be in past years when ASM, American Society for Microbiology, did these surveys of hand washing in public uh, establishments, ballparks, airports, et cetera. You remember the headlines? They would make it actually in the front pages of the national news. And it would say, one third of adults don't wash their hands after using the restroom. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make. That's thinking like a microbiologist or a food scientist. That's not the way to communicate that. Because if you communicate one-third, a large section of society doesn't wash their hands after using the restroom, what does that signal to others? The right way to communicate it would be that two-thirds of the majority of Americans wash their hands, but we still have a way to go. To put that type of social pressure on those that don't. Um, Another way to leverage the principle of social norm is uh, in how often you show the right behavior. I'll give you an example. My prior employer, I was focused on trying to improve hand washing. And generally when you do that, you'll make a video of how to do hand washing the right way. The behavioral principle of social norm says that maybe you're better off, and there are studies that have proven this, by showing the behavior multiple times by different employees the right way so that an employee that watches that says, oh, okay, everybody's doing it, so maybe I should too. I could go on and on, but we have to leverage behavioral science principles in how we do our work. Another thing that we're talking about in the new era of smarter food safety is creating a social marketing plan as part of this core element. And um, I know that many listening will be uh, behavioral scientists, you'll have backgrounds in psychology, but the, the question is, uh, how, do you, how do you convince larger groups of people? If you think about uh, behavior change in general, there's a lot of behavioral change theories. 
and model the behavior. But one that has proven very effective over the past couple of decades is one called social marketing. It's a model. And the principle there is just to use the same types of ideas and strategies that commercial institutions use to try to get you to buy their products or let's say to visit their theme parks, using those same principles to try to get you to change your behaviors for social good. And so that's what we're talking about, um, making sure that you have audience segmentation, that you uh, have the message where the behavior is desired. And it's a whole great model. One of the professors that I studied under at the University of South Florida, Dr. Carol Bryant, was a pioneer in this. And um, if you have an interest in, in behavior change on a large scale in the communities that you're working in, I would strongly suggest, if you haven't already, to freshen up on social marketing. And so we want to create a social marketing campaign, a plan for this new era of smarter food safety and work with you to do that. Uh, culture and beliefs. Can we measure? I believe that human behavior can and must be measured. You know, it's one thing to measure knowledge and skills, you have to do that, and we do that, right? And we train people, we'll give them tests, and we'll see do they have the knowledge and skills. But then do they apply it? The one thing to say, okay, you can pass a driver's test, but then do you drive safely on the street, or do you speed? And so that's why you have people trying to measure uh, the behavior. And so culture can be measured, and so can beliefs, and we should look at how do we further strengthen and advance this notion. I'll give you one simple example that's really powerful for me. Uh, I was working for the, a large retailer, and that retailer would hire a third party to inspect every single store, retail establishment that they had, 6,000 across the country, every month. Every single month, a firm coming in and doing a retail food safety audit. Uh, early on, I was able to convince leaders in that organization to have courage and to do a food safety culture survey of their employees, an anonymous survey where you would ask thousands of employees questions around food safety. And the types of questions you would ask uh, were questions at getting to the brutal facts about what did people really believe about food safety in that organization. I'll give an example of uh, one, one of the questions uh, that we had in there is, our food safety practices do not change when the health inspector arrives. Strongly agree to strongly disagree. You have to have courage to get the answer to that question if you're working for a large organization. Bottom line is we did this survey, thousands of employees, and um, what I had one of the employees that worked for me in food safety tell me, Frank, I've been working here for many, many years. I've been looking at these retail inspections, you know, month after month of all of our stores, and I learned more about this company's food safety with one culture survey than I did, you know, X number of years of monthly retail food safety audits. I share that with you as illustration that sometimes these different metrics together, being able to measure culture, as well as doing traditional measurements of food temperatures and sanitation, might be more powerful in how we advance food safety in an institution. And then last but not least, we are committed here at the agency to internalize this concept of food safety culture and how we think, how we approach our work, how we approach our inspections, how we approach training uh, uh, in terms of making sure that everybody here is committed to this idea and principle. Next slide, please. So as we look to the future of food safety culture, you know, we'll work together with you. We don't have all of the answers at this time, but um, I was asked by Steve to try to give a little bit more detail. We'll work together to define what this concept of food safety culture really means, uh, and more importantly, define what does it mean in terms of the regulatory context uh, and look and work together with you and industry to figure out how do we create stronger cultures of food safety, uh, not just combined with regulatory programs. The reality is we'll all be better off if food producers are what I call responsible for food safety versus accountable food safety. Accountable is, you know, people are going to follow or they start following when you arrive or when the health inspector arrives. Uh, because, you know, we're going to check, and if they're not following rules, we'll write them up, or we'll give them a warning, we could even shut down their facility. Responsible is that establishment is going to operate that way every day, whether you or I ever show up. And so we, we have to do this to be successful. The food system is just too big and too decentralized. 
uh, for it to rely on us being there. It's really industry and food operators' responsibility. And let's figure out together how to measure food safety culture and leverage those measurements. Uh, there are already some tools being developed in the private sector to measure food safety culture. The only regulatory agency that I know that has done this is the UK FSA, Food Standards Authority. They created a toolbox to help inspectors of what they call catering facilities in the UK a few years ago try to gauge food safety culture. But let's work together and let's, let's pilot and let's do some proof of concepts and figure out if we can measure it. And then lastly, support the tools for companies to do so too. So a lot of work on food safety culture. I hope that I've given you a little bit more substance than uh, the look ahead. Uh, but I'm convinced that strong food safety cultures are prerequisites to effective food safety management. Next slide, please. Uh, the next core element uh, of, of the blueprint is smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak uh, response. And this, of all the core elements, in the blueprint is probably the biggest section. There are a lot of ideas there. Again, I would encourage you to look at them. My advice would be to go through the blueprint with the highlighter and figure out how you want to engage with us because there's so much work to do. Uh, but I'll give you some of the ideas. Clearly, it suggests that we need to leverage data. There's no question about it. In most organizations, there's more food safety data being captured today than was captured over the past five years. And Increasingly, as that data becomes digitized, we know that a lot of the food safety data historically on paper has been what I call a dead end. You know, you got it on paper, there's nothing else you can do with it. But the more that you digitize it, uh, the more that that can lead to meaningful action. In that, A, you can have big data and you can analyze and discover trends and find out that those questions you should have been asking all along that you just didn't know because you weren't analyzing the data. B, uh, I believe, and I've seen this, you can automate certain processes because it's digitized and make them safe. And you can have a lot more insights. A perfect example is cooking rotisserie chicken in a retail establishment that uh, I used to work for. You know, we could try to improve rotisserie chicken uh, by doing a lot of education and training. Um, but we took different approaches, and one of them was digitizing every single temperature check on digital or on rotisserie chicken so that N equals all, and that gives us a bunch of insight. So we're going to figure out how to leverage all of this new data that's being captured, structured, unstructured, uh, to provide smarter tools and approaches to prevention. Uh, the one example that I can give you, if you go to the next slide, uh, that we've already started working on, and you've probably heard me talk about this in the past, but it's one that I'm so excited about, and we really have to put the pedal down and accelerate this. I think most of the listeners know that Americans want their food to be safe, whether it's imported or comes for, uh, you know, produced domestically. And one of the things we try to do, as you know, through the Food Safety Modernization Act, is require foreign companies to comply with U.S. food safety standards. But another, what I call hurdle in that safety net is to make sure that once foods get to our port, that we do some type of risk ranking, and we occasionally pull samples and do, do inspections. We've done that with the state-of-the-art system, which is the gold standard called PREDICT. We wanted to see if we could strengthen our predictive capabilities for the PREDICT system by leveraging AI or machine learning more specifically. And so we looked at two years of retrospective seafood data, seafood imports, because seafoods are one of the category of foods most commonly imported into the U.S. And uh, we wanted to see if we added on this additional functionality of AI, would it strengthen or increase our predictive capabilities of finding biology products? And the proof of concept did just that. Uh, the commissioner and I put out a statement on it uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, imagine this, because this is what the proof of concept suggested. Envision in your mind a port of entry with containers, literally thousands of containers of food items, and you increasing your ability by 300% of finding which container has a biotic food product. That's what machine learning can potentially do. And I'm more excited about what we might do in other areas of predictive analytics than I am just screening imports. Think about your own operations. Imagine if you dramatically increased your confidence or uh, predictive capabilities saying, I need to be at these establishments at this time 
rather than a frequency-based inspection model. And so let's work together. I think there's, there's a lot we can do to strengthen predictive capabilities. Another one, for example, is we said we're going to use smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response. We've seen at the state and local levels how state and locals are leaning into these predictive tools in different models of detecting whether there's a food safety problem or a foodborne illness. And we've seen pilots done in uh, cities and states across the nation where if they're looking at um, what consumers are capturing on dining apps such as Yelp, they might be more likely to predict uh, whether they have food safety problems in a local jurisdiction. So let's look together on those. Another area in this section of the blueprint that we want to work on is recalls and recall modernization. Uh, we've gotten a lot better, but recalls have changed a lot these days if you think about how organizations execute recalls. And so uh, we know that APCO has a passion around this topic. We expect you to be good partners with us on this. You know, there's some subtle differences between how FDA does recalls and USDA, so we want to work to try to harmonize those approaches. And we want to leverage data. In the blueprint, you'll see that we want to create a U.S. government app to notify consumers about recalls in a more timely manner. And in fact, we even want to look at exploring ways to send out registered lockdown capabilities uh, through universal codes uh, that are using common equipment so uh, they can implement it and, and stop sales can be prevented if the product has been recalled in a retailer, for example, can't pull that product off the shelf. And then lastly, look, uh, while we're on this core element, let me talk a little bit about virtual remote inspections. I think many of you know that uh, at the height of the pandemic, the FDA rightfully so uh, stopped doing routine inspections or surveillance inspections to protect AR workforce and also prevent contributing the spread of coronavirus. And shortly after, you know that we introduced this concept of remote or virtual assessments, specifically in foreign supplier verification programs. This was an idea that was always in our blueprint well before the pandemic, and we saw when the pandemic hit that we needed to lean in there. We, on a regular basis every week, are talking to countries around the world, and I will tell you, there's just been an explosion in 2020 of both private sector and public sector leveraging this concept of virtual remote monitoring or inspections, and the reality, it's taken off faster than we can develop it in a thoughtful and um, prudent manner. I've always said we got to, doing them without question is going to drive efficiencies. I don't think anybody's going to question, boy, there's a lot of efficiencies of doing things virtually or remotely. That's not the question. The question is, how effective are they? And if they're not as effective, or can they be more effective, depending on how digitized the company is and what kind of insights you might gain, but if they're not as effective or if they're somewhat effective, how do you use them? as a complement or an adjunct to your traditional oversight uh, mechanisms or schemes. And so that's another thing we'll be working on. There's already work groups assembled, uh, I think maybe with an AFTO and certainly with an FDA, and so let's make sure that we're connected on how do we advance this concept of virtual remote monitoring and inspections for the future. Next slide, please. Mutual reliance, we've always stated that we have to work closely with the states, and so uh, we're going to continue to do that, and in fact, in the blueprint, uh, it's our commitment to double down on mutual reliance. And uh, we want to work with the states in, in even a stronger and more collaborative manner that's dependent on information sharing, leveraging each other's insights, leveraging each other's inspectional work, <coughs> analytical work, and so expect to hear more from FDA on how, how do we work together to strengthen mutual reliance. Next slide, please. A third area is new business models and retail modernization. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't spend, I have to spend a lot of time persuading you that we knew that e-commerce was exploding. Uh, we know that consumers have largely con already converted to buying products online in other areas or categories. Shelf-stable goods, you buy a lot of that online. Merchandise, soft goods, clothing, uh, hardware, etc. And that this was coming on now with the food. In fact, the projections were one at every five dollars by the year 2025. But what we saw through the pandemic with the requirement to shelter in place, uh, what we've seen is this explosion or tsunami of people making the conversion to buying foods online because they have to shelter in place. Or now, not shelter in place because they want to avoid large crowds. 
We also very surprisingly have seen that this is happening in demographics that we never expected would make that conversion. This is not a trend. I think we're all going to look back in time and say, hey, this was this created a new norm and it'll accelerate this conversion. Uh, it'll accelerate people that want to get into this business. It will accelerate traditional brick and mortar that wants to do more in this area. It'll accelerate new entries into <clears throat> wanting to sell food online, maybe people that haven't historically operated in the food sector. And so the question for us will be, uh, how do we oversee and ensure the appropriate industry standard of care for e-commerce, which isn't defined one single way. There's omnichannel, meaning a combination of brick and mortar and e-commerce. E-commerce in and of itself, there are a lot of forms and varieties. We've all wrestled with establishments and saying, is this a retail establishment or is this more of a manufacturer in the classical business sense? Uh, we've wrestled with concepts now with ghost kitchens where a lot of different companies are using a production facility to serve consumers. And so I know the states have had to grapple with this. Uh, we want to work with you on this and, and create a harmonized approach to this once and for all on behalf of the nation. And so that'll be an area that we'll work on together. And next slide, please, as I told you, we're very committed to bending the curve of foodborne illness. And to do that, we have to tackle foodborne illnesses that occur at retail. <clears throat> CDC tells us that a common nexus for foodborne outbreaks are things that happen at, at food service in particular, catering establishment. <clears throat> and so we're going to have to work on that together. Uh, and in particular, if you look at the out of compliance rates as defined by the FDA baseline risk factors, the reason I like to show this image is that they haven't changed much in the past few decades. And so how do we change the trajectory of them? How do we once and for all bring them down? Next slide, please. Love this quote. I thought it was worth putting in here. And if you notice, it's a quote from a behavioral psychologist and not a food safety professional. Abram Matzbach. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. You see, what we're trying to do in this new era is add new and more modern tools to your toolbox, realizing that the tools of inspection, the tools of training, and the tools of testing are really important, but they're not enough tools to win the battle against foodborne disease. So next slide. For traditional retail food safety, we do plan to hold a retail food safety summit. We have had these conversations with APTO. APTO will play a central role in that but really giving permission to people that participate to think out of the box, to think blue sky. We're not talking about things that can't be done. Just look at the changes that are happening in business sectors all around us. How could we approach retail food safety differently? We've worked a lot on modernization of food supply, of food safety oversight through FISMA. Some will tell me, some of the locals tell me that they felt like maybe we took a pause at least in terms of an agency and accelerating our retail food safety approaches. And so we're recommitting to you that we'll modernize approaches for retail as well. We'll have to take a look at smarter kitchen designs and smarter equipment. Clearly, small mom and pops may not be leveraging this, but the larger institutions are, and we should figure out what that means to us. Enhanced food safety management systems. The reality is um, it's not enough to just pass, I think, a retail food inspection once uh, a quarter or once every six months or maybe even once a year. But what are those establishments doing to manage the risks and the hazards in those establishments on a daily basis? Because they're the ones that have to practice food safety the right way every day. And then we'll take a look at the food code and making sure that A, there's full adoption of the food code across the nation, but that B, uh, through the Conference of Food Protection, that the food code continues to stay up to date and be the best that it can be. Next slide, please. And tech enabled traceability. Uh, I'll just say, next slide, please. I think you all know how passionate we are about food traceability. Uh, I'll go light on this one because we have just proposed a new rule on food traceability. Uh, it was Section 204 of FISMA. We've just proposed it. Hopefully, you've taken a look at that. What's critical is that unlike previous food traceability proposals or rules that you've seen in other countries that talk about just one step up and one step back, the real brilliancy in this proposal is that we've identified what are the key data elements that different nodes in the food system have to keep and what are the critical tracking events when food changes hand, when food is transformed, uh, 
where the ingredients might be combined. And by doing that, we believe we're creating the equivalent of a common language that's going to allow traceability to scale. We're going to have three public meetings occurring here in the very near future, and so if you have an interest in traceability and what it might mean to your work, because I think it will change how uh, folks at the local level do tracebacks, uh, tune into one of those meetings. Next slide, please. And our goal is to, uh, I would say first and foremost, provide a new level of transparency in the food system. I often say that good food traceability is the equivalent of pouring concrete for the nation's interstate highway system. And when you know how food travels from farm to table, then you can start layering on monitoring and predictive analytics. Uh, so I think this new level of transparency and getting rid of anonymity in the food system will be a powerful effect on prevention. Uh, but then we do know when outbreaks unfortunately do occur, we'll be able to get back to source quicker and make sure that those outbreaks are smaller and that we don't have to do these overly broad and very damaging consumer advisories. Next slide, please. Uh, before I close here, just wanted to give an update on cyclospora. Well, it, it's not identified in the blueprint. I think everyone knows, I mentioned the increased year after year in cyclospora cases, and so this year we were able to make some advancements in finding cyclospora for the first time in an in-field uh, investigation. We recovered it from a canal uh, located to one of the farms that was implicated in traceback. And the next slide. I think you know we're adding new tools on how we prevent ag contamination, um, not only advancing uh, you know, our, our work on the new ag water standard, which we publicly committed to. I think everyone knows we've created a leafy green action plan, but we just for the first time worked with EPA to create a protocol on how companies that make disinfectants can register them for ag water purposes and improve public health. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll go to the next slide because I want to allow a little bit of time for questions. I think we're close to the end. Next slide, please. If you want to learn more, I went through that pretty quickly. You can subscribe to a listserv, get updates on it. We're going to have a series of meetings, going to have work together. Uh, but I'll close with what the, the way I usually close, which is uh, there's so much more, if you can go to the next slide, that we can be doing on this new area by working together. And uh, while we've seen some challenges this year, I have no doubt that working together, uh, we're going to create a stronger, more resilient, and I would say I'm convinced a safer food system than ever before. So thank you, APCA attendees, for listening, and I'm hoping now we can pause and take a few questions. Absolutely. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Frank. That was great, and you definitely uh, responded to the challenge of helping us with a little more information on food safety culture. We appreciate that. Uh, the first question I, I'm going to hit on actually relates to food safety culture. And the question is, food safety culture not only impacts um, uh, the industry, but also impacts regulatory agencies. And this person's asking specifically, what's FDA done to implement a successful uh, food safety culture in their field-based organization with investigators, supervisors, managers, and executives? Yeah, so we're at the early days of this. I know that FDA has been talking about this concept of food safety culture for a while now. Um, they've held internal meetings and had guest speakers. Uh, we do want to create uh, training and education curriculums for inspectors here at FDA, and so we've been talking about doing just that. And in fact, uh, Steve, one of the things I challenge the team on is, is when we do that, let's not do that just for FDA inspectors. Let's do that for inspectors in general, any regulator across the U.S. And so there's a challenge. But um, to answer your question, it's early days, and we want to invest in these concepts of food safety culture and human behavior and what a food inspector should know. Um, I would imagine it's going to be introducing these concepts in a little bit more substance and depth. I would imagine, you know, it's freshening up some of the psychology courses that we took in the past, you know, because it's been a while. Uh, and maybe giving some real tactical or practical examples of how uh, institutions have used these concepts to strengthen food safety. It's, it's not a foreign idea. You know, um, many parts of government are looking at leveraging behavioral insights and behavioral sciences and how they become more effective. And so it, it's just time that we do this in our, in our space as well. Absolutely. Uh, 
I've got another question that came in, and I'm going to acknowledge who this came in from. Uh, Joe Corby, our former executive director and now senior advisor to AFTO on food safety. But his question is, uh, how does the Smarter uh, Era food, uh, footprint and blueprint, excuse me, harmonize with the ongoing effort for an integrated food safety system? Yeah, I, I think it, it harmonizes really well. If you look about uh, the idea of mutual reliance and working together, it has to accelerate the idea that we're going to have to work and share data. Um, and so uh, I think it's one of the same. Smarter food safety is uh, any regulatory or public health agency working on food safety should be working in a more coordinated manner. And so when you think about core element two, smarter tools and approaches will have to leverage that. Uh, I think it will be not only a commitment in how we work and share information, I think it's going to be a commitment in information sharing and IT resources, um, but we'll have to figure that out together. Let's do one last question, Frank, I, I, and wrap up at the top of the hour. But the question really is, we had a series of questions in the chat about transportation. And really, how do we deal with this new last mile challenge? Any thoughts? Does this require a change in how we approach the food code? Uh, any thoughts that you have in advance on that question? Yeah, no, it, it's an interesting one because I, I, I saw this real time um, evolving. And in fact, it's, it's more evolved in advance in other parts of the world. You know, all you have to do is go to some other countries and you'll see all different types of transportation and how that last mile, you know, it used to be just, if you got it to the grocery store, it ended there. Uh, but that last mile from around the corner to the consumer's home ch changes. I mean, some real basic principles that we need to be aware of. And, uh, the first thing I say, Steve, is what I call TTT. Uh, while we can't control how that last mile is going to occur, we as public health professionals to ensure that these basic requirements are met, time and or temperature control. And so that's T, two of the T's, time and temperature control. And we should insist on that. But there's a lot of work to be done. There's different ways. If you look at companies or packaging materials, companies are shipping and transporting, a lot of those companies haven't validated whether the time temperature profiles can be kept. Um, some companies are boxing things and sending them. No idea that in a worst case scenario will it stand up to the, the appropriate temperature control that's needed. And so we need more work around time and temperature control and validation of that and guidance to the industry on what right looks like and the validation studies that should be done before they embark on those approaches. Uh, the third thing is, is tamper resistance. Uh, you know, we've got to make sure that those products can't be uh, tampered with. And we've seen some surveys that suggest that sometimes those products are tampered with by delivery drivers, et cetera. Uh, and then the last one is we have to prevent cross-contamination. And at least the record survey suggested that uh, there's, there might be opportunities to minimize cross-contamination and temperature control. But I think increasingly that's going to become part of the food traceability story and making sure that we can trace and monitor that last mile as it changes. Well, thank you very much for participating today. The slides will be made available along with a copy of the recording. So those will be coming out uh, uh, later this week. And we appreciate once again, Deputy Commissioner Giannis's willingness to participate and his staff willingness to assist with uh, this uh, webinar today. We hope you'll join us again and we should put in a plug. I believe you are having a, a stakeholder update on the blueprint here on what is it, the 26th of October? Am I remembering correctly? Yeah, we're going we're gonna, to, I hope you all can tune in. We're going to talk about the new era, the first 100 days, and what have been some of the accomplishments. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for participating, and thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate everyone's participation. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Be safe.